Okay. So I go ahead. Okay. Okay. So good evening, everyone. This is a, a brief presentation on the national supermodel that has been created for predicting the trajectory of COVID-19 pandemic in the country. Uh, let's uh, uh, start with uh, some basic uh, discussion about the pandemics and uh, their mathematical modeling. Uh, one very curious which is flu, plague, cholera, or uh, the present one, is that uh, they exhibit a very sharp rise and fall. Uh, for example, if you look at this, uh, this is a flu pandemic uh, in uh, UK, and this is the uh, the number of deaths per thousand persons have been plotted here against the dates. If you notice, uh, somewhere around end September, the number of deaths start rising up very rapidly, and by end October. Uh, or rather, sorry, in December, this uh, number has again come down to very small. So there is a very sharp rise and peak and the equally sharp fall. Uh, the question that arose uh, at that time is that what exactly is causing such rapid increase and then fall? And can one mathematically explain this? So towards this, uh, uh, the first model uh, that was created was by Carmack and McKendrick in the year 1927. They proposed uh, what is now called SIR model. In this model, the entire population of the region where the pandemic is spreading, that population is divided into three disjoint groups. The first one is susceptible group. This is the population that is not yet infected but is uh, now open for infection sometime in future. Second group is infected population, those who have already been infected and currently are undergoing their infection. And the third is removed population. This is a population that was infected at some point in the past, but is no longer infected, uh, which is uh, either through getting cured of it or in unfortunate cases through the demise of the person. So these three categories uh, were defined by Kermak and McHenry. And it's clear that uh, from susceptible, the person will move to infected category. And from infected, the person will move to removed category. Notice also that uh, this uh, it's a fairly simple model. It assumes that uh, once a person is removed, uh, he or she does not become susceptible ever again. That's a simplifying assumption. It is true for certain kind of pandemics, but also not true for certain others where the antibodies uh, against the disease uh, do not last for a long time. Those uh, additional considerations are brought in subsequently on top of SIR model. But at its simplest form, this SIR model already did a very good job in explaining that sharp rise and fall. So let's see some more details of how these transitions take place between these three categories. So we'll use uh, three variables, uh, S, I, and R, which each one of them are functions of time, to represent the fraction of population in each of these three groups that I just defined, S for susceptible, I for infected, and R for removed. And since we are talking about fractions, uh, it's clear that S plus I plus R equals one. Now, how do susceptible transition to infected category? Well, uh, clearly the larger infected people are out there, the more likelihood that a susceptible person will come in contact with that person and catch the infection. <coughs> Excuse me. So uh, the rate of movement of susceptible into infected, therefore, becomes proportional to I. 
category. And similarly, this is true with every susceptible person. So the larger the number of susceptible persons are there, the more people will move to infected category. So the rate of movement also becomes proportional to the S. And that's how this equation comes in, that ds by dt equals minus beta times s times i. Here, beta is some constant of proportionality. Now, infected people get removed in proportion to the size of infected category. And that's how dr by dt equals some, again, gamma and other constant times i. Once we have a movement from susceptible to infected and infected to removed, then uh, the dynamics of the infected category are frozen, uh, which is uh, that di by dt, that is the number of new infections coming in at any point in time, is equal to beta si, these are susceptible transitioning to infected, minus gamma i, which is infected transitioning to removed. And that this equation therefore determines the change in the infected category. Uh, this is a small point that fatalities are uh, already as per definition is a subset of the uh, removed category and change in the number of fatalities is also proportional to i. So there is another constant eta that uh, determines that rate. So the, these three constants beta, gamma and eta completely determine, as per this model, the trajectory of pandemic. Now, depending on the pandemic, their values are different. And uh, by looking at the data uh, of uh, new infections, the new recoveries and new mortalities, one can deduce the value of these three parameters and therefore define the pandemic completely. And it turned out that uh, uh, for that 1918 flu, uh, this SIR model was able to very nicely explain why that trajectory was taken. So since then, uh, the pandemics are being modeled via SIR model. Uh, over time, it has been realized that uh, not all infections uh, follow a very simple SIR trajectory. So some additions have been made to SIR model. Uh, but before I describe the addition, let us let me share one more very important aspect of SIR model, which uh, is the identification of the peak of the pandemic. Uh, the peak occurs when the number of infected people is at its maximum. And if one looks at uh, the diff, uh, at maxima of i, di by dt is 0, and di by dt is determined by, uh, equal to beta si minus gamma i. And from this, one gets that at the peak, s equals gamma over beta, which is also uh, denoted as 1 over r naught. r naught is a familiar quantity some of you may have heard. Uh, that determines whether a pandemic spreads or does not spread. If that is clear from this equation also, that S is uh, at the peak 1 over R0, and once S becomes smaller than 1 over R0, then the pandemic starts reducing in its intensity. And which also shows that if R0 is less than or equal to 1, there is no spread, because if R0 is less than or equal to 1, then already the peak has occurred even before the pandemic starts. So the graph will continuously go down for pandemic. Therefore, there is no spread. The farther or the larger the value of R0 is, the longer the peak and the uh, longer the pandemic lasts. OK, so let's now move on to some modification of SIR model. The first one I'll discuss is uh, called SEIR model. This is uh, motivated by some pandemics, for example, measles, where an infected person initially uh, does not spread the infection to others. So there is a gestation period during which a person gets infected. The virus is inside the body, taking some time to become uh, active. And this 
dynamics of the pandemic was captured by this SEIR, SEIR variant, where susceptible first transition to exposed category, which is that infected but not yet spreading, then infected and finally removed. So now we have four categories instead of three and the equations governing these transitions are also reasonably straightforward given what we just saw. Uh, if you let S, E, I, and R represent this fraction of population in these four categories, their sum is clearly one. Then change in uh, S is same as before, minus beta times S, I. Uh, change in exposed category, everybody who gets infected first comes into exposed. And then an alpha fraction of that moves out and becomes infected, goes into the I category. And that's what DIY DT denotes here, alpha E coming in and gamma I going to the removed category and DR by DT equals gamma I. Another interesting point to note here is that uh, if you add E and I and make it one single category, then it, we basically get the SIR module. So in that sense, it's a refinement of SIR module. So SEIR model allowed one, uh, the uh, epidemiologists to model certain pandemics quite nicely, but not all of them. So once uh, this was realized, okay, this has stopped. So the, not all pandemics follow that trajectory. Here is an example. The COVID-19 is a dark example of that, where an infected person upon in, uh, stays asymptomatic. That is, there are no visible symptoms that the person has. So it's very hard to detect if a person has been infected with this disease. And that makes uh, the tracking of disease very difficult and also it uh, increases the spread in a sense because the infected person who is asymptomatic does not even realize that he or she has the infection and then it spreads it all over. So this particular dynamic uh, was captured by a variant called SAIR model. Here there are now again four categories. Susceptible starts with becoming asymptomatic, that is infected, but not showing symptoms. Asymptomatic people can take two paths. Either they stay asymptomatic the entire duration and eventually are removed. Or they become symptomatic, then they move to the infected category and then eventually are removed. So removed category essentially now is split into two sub groups. One is removed from asymptomatic category, other is removed from infected category. So corresponding to these, uh, five variables are now in, brought in, S, A, I, and R, A, which is removed from asymptomatic, and R, I, which is removed from infected. The sum of all these five again is one. Uh, now the change from symptomatic, oh, sorry, uh, susceptible to asymptomatic that uh, the number of the rate of change in susceptible is now beta times S times A plus I. A plus I represents the total number of infected people and they are all spreading infection. So that's why this term comes in. Uh, change in asymptomatic category, firstly beta S A plus I is coming in from susceptible. Delta A, so the delta fraction go and become infected by exhibiting symptoms. Gamma A fraction goes to the removed. Similarly, uh, DI by DT, which is uh, the new symptomatic infected people, delta A fraction comes in from asymptomatic and gamma A fraction goes out to removed. And similarly, DRA by DT and DRI by DT. Once again, if you add A and I and R A and R I, then, then you get three groups which 
satisfy exactly the SIR equations. So this is also a refinement of SIR model. Now, COVID-19 pandemic uh, is uh, quite different from, in some ways, from earlier pandemics in that it not only has uh, many asymptomatic cases, in fact, most of the cases appear to be asymptomatic. So these are almost never detected and they continue passing infections to others. Of course, those with this, that the people who exhibit serious symptoms, they do report to the medical centers and they do get recognized of having been infected. Now, this situation raises the following very interesting question that if we cannot detect asymptomatic infected people, how do we even estimate how this trajectory of uh, uh, COVID-19 is growing? How many people are there which are actually in, infected? Uh, SAIR model, while it does capture the dynamics uh, reasonably well, uh, it does not provide an easy way of estimating the parameters. So now there is an additional parameter delta also, which is the fraction that moves from asymptomatic to symptomatic. And it also does not provide an easy way of estimating the asymptomatic cases. So this was the conundrum uh, to address which this uh, Department of Science and Technology created the Supermodel Committee to create a national supermodel. It was chaired by Professor Vidya Sagar of IIT Hyderabad and uh, there were uh, nine other members of this committee. The mandate of the committee was essentially to look at various possible models that exist uh, and various um, to approach various groups in the country who are working on these models and uh, pick up good elements from them to create a super model which can provide robust forecasting for COVID-19. Also, uh, part of mandate was to quantify the effects of lockdowns and migrations and prevention measures. And finally, to suggest uh, way to the future, which will uh, not, which will optimize the economical aspect of this pandemic also. So the committee, uh, after deliberation over a couple of months, uh, having contacted more than 30 groups in the country and getting their suggestions, finally uh, zeroed on a variant of SAIR model, which I am calling here as SUIR model. The categories remain the same, except that interpretation of A and I has is changed now. A is interpreted as infected but undetected population. So there are certain tests which are done to detect if some persons have been infected. And A is precisely those that do not get detected. And I are those who are infected and get detected. This brophery corresponds to the earlier in uh, uh, meaning of A and I because nearly uh, or rather I should say nearly everyone in A will be asymptomatic because those who are exhibit serious symptoms will get detected. So that also means that most of the symptomatic cases are will be in I but at the same time I will also contain many asymptomatic cases who get detected through contact tracing, although they may not exhibit any symptoms. So this uh, diagram for this model remains essentially the same. Uh, but what this change in perception uh, approach or view uh, allowed the committee was to slightly change the dynamics the way it happens in SAIR model, which in turn led to a better estimation of uh, quicker estimation of parameters as well as number of asymptomatic cases. So again, this has this uh, usual uh, five uh, groups, who, which all add up to one, and D, which is a fraction of deaths, that is a subgroup of 
or high, uh, here we make the assumption that those with serious symptoms are the ones that eventually some of them may uh, die and they are all part of the group I. There are four parameters, so beta, gamma uh, and eta are already present in SIR model and there is a fourth parameter epsilon which was introduced. This corresponds to the fraction of new infections that get detected. So all the anytime the new infections come in, only a fraction of them are get detected and move to the category I. The remaining stay in category A. And that's epsilon determines that fraction. And now the dynamics of this uh, is very similar to SAIR with slight changes. Uh, now DS by DT remains the same. DA by DT of the new infections coming in, which are precisely beta S times A plus I, 1 minus epsilon fraction comes into A, that's what it is, and gamma A gets removed. And in the category I, the new infections coming in is the epsilon fraction of uh, beta S A plus I, that's what this term denotes. Gamma I fraction gets removed and the rest remaining the same. So that's the only change. That's one term has got changed here to uh, explicitly denote that is epsilon fraction are getting detected and the rest remain undetected. Now this slight change uh, fortunately allows for much better analysis of uh, this model. Uh, this. Uh, like I said, allows uh, we can quickly estimate uh, all the parameter values as well as undetected cases. The fraction of detected cases clearly depends on uh, how much testing is being done, the policy of that the testing that is done, and also the number of asymptomatic cases are out there. So, how are the parameters estimated? Let me very quickly run you through that. Uh, what we have available is three daily time series of I, which is uh, detected cases. All the new detected cases are reported in I. All the new curved cases are, uh, are reported in RI, and all the new fatalities are reported in D. So these three daily time series, RI, by the way, includes D. Uh, these three daily time series are available for any region, district, state, or the country. And if you, the last two equations, DRI by DT equals gamma times I, DDD by DT equals eta times I, uh, we know what DRI by DT is, we know what D, D by DT, DT is, we know I also. So it's very easy to estimate gamma and eta. Uh, you just collect uh, multiple data points of this, use a standard least square method to estimate the slope of this. Uh, what is more interesting is the estimation of the other two parameters, namely beta and epsilon. Uh, it turns out that the governing equation result in the following equality. I equals 1 over beta times d i plus r i by t t plus 1 over epsilon times i into i plus r i. Now using this equation, both beta and epsilon can be calculated. It requires a little more careful uh, uh, estimation. Uh, but it can be done using fairly standard techniques. What unfortunately happens here is that uh, if you recall, the, the all of these were I, Ri, etc. were fractions. Uh, by We get that by dividing it from effective population. Uh, but uh, the reported numbers are absolute, so that is not divided by effective population. So that uh, if this equation was linear, we can clear out that uh, division from everywhere. But since this is the quadratic part of it, that denominator cannot get cleared out. So estimation of epsilon actually gives epsilon times p, where p is the effective population. Now this effective population changes over time because initially when the pandemic started, the infection was limited to very, very small pockets of the country. So the effective population was therefore very small. And over a period of time, today perhaps one can say that effective population is nearly the entire country. So 
in order to get the value of epsilon properly, we'll need uh, the an estimate of effective population also. However, another interesting thing is that we don't, even if we don't get effective population, even if we just estimate epsilon times p, we can completely predict the dynamics. It does not change the dynamics of the pandemic. So even with the epsilon times p value, uh, we will be able to derive all the necessary conclusions that we have. Of course, the parameter values change with time. Uh, gamma and eta change with improvements in healthcare. Uh, because uh, gamma is the effective recovery rate. So if you get better medical attention, the recovery rate will improve. So gamma will increase. Eta will reduce because eta is mortality rate. Again, with the improvement in healthcare, eta will reduce. Uh, beta captures the rate at which the infection is spreading in the in a particular region. And lockdowns, personal protection measures, etc., they all reduce value of beta. Epsilon P, that's the effect, the, the parameter that we can calculate. This depends on, as I already mentioned, on testing policy and also changes in effective population. So this epsilon p, therefore, is dependent on uh, spread across the region. So when the infection moves to a new region, p increases and therefore epsilon p also increases. So all these four parameters, therefore, change with time. And these Changes are also affected by explicit external strategies. So we can actually make a guess as to what, uh, when those changes occur. Now, what we did was that uh, we looked at uh, significant changes in these four parameter values. And whenever that change occurs, we mark that date as now this is, this date is inducing a phase change. And what we got was something interesting, somewhat expected also. Phase one uh, ended on March 31st, which coincides with essentially the lockdown being introduced in the country. Phase two lasted the whole of April. Uh, phase three lasted from May 1 to 15th June. Phase four lasted from June 16th to July 15th. Phase 5 from July 16 to August 15, and phase 6 is continuing from August 16 till present. The parameter values haven't changed very much in this past uh, two odd months. If you notice, uh, most of these phase boundaries, at least last four, are at the middle of a month. If you recall the way lockdown strategies have been implemented, they the strategies have been changing at the end of a month or beginning of a month. From this, it appears uh, that it takes about two weeks time for a change in strategy to get reflected in the data. And that's also uh, a reasonably uh, justified assumption because uh, it does take some time for the uh, infection to spread to other people and them to, for it to get manifested and detected. So roughly two, about two weeks time is taking. So at the, for example, at the, uh, this phase change of June 15 corresponds to the change in strategy or lockdown strategy, which was initiated on 1st of June and so on. And here are the estimated parameter values that we get for these six phases. So epsilon P, this is an interesting one. Phase one was about 3000. Uh, which has effectively denotes that P was quite small at the time. And this is something we all uh, can easily guess. And if uh, one assumes that the effective population was around a uh, few lakhs at the time, because it's uh, only in Delhi, Mumbai, Bangalore, there are some small pockets where the infection was initially concentrated in before the lockdown. So a few lakhs would be a reasonable assumption for the uh, P at the time. 
and that would give us something uh, epsilon value to be about uh, one over hundred or so. So that means uh, for every detected case, there were about hundred undetected cases at the time. In phase two, uh, the value went up by twenty-three times. Then phase three, it went up by four hundred thirty times from phase one. So from phase two to phase three, there was a change of about eighteen times. Phase three to phase four, there was a change for about one and a half times. Four to five, there was about five times increase, and five to six, about twice the increase. So overall, phase six about seven thousand times bigger than phase one value. Uh, one over beta uh, started with four point six. So beta, if you recall, was a uh, probability of spreading. So it measures the spread. The larger beta is, the uh, more, the faster the uh, disease is spreading. In other words, it's saying if one over beta is the smaller it is, the faster the disease is spreading. So it was pre-locked on 4.6. Immediately afterwards, it went up to 7.4, and then phase three was the highest value, it touched nearly 10. Then it came down to this is, represents uh, the May period, May and mid June, and. Phase four, it came down to 6.8, which is like mid June to mid July. Phase five onwards is stable at 8.2. So it again increased from phase four to phase five and six. Uh, gamma has been continuously improving. This is uh, again gamma and eta are both uh, dependent on the medical care. So 0 0.02, 0 0.03, 0 0.05, 0 0.065, and so on. Eta has been consistently reducing 0 0.005, 3003, and so on. Now it's at 0 0.001. And if you look at the corresponding SIR model, by as I already mentioned, by combining, you can look at the SIR model and you can put that R0 value, which determines the peak. So it uh, started with about 11, and then it has been consistently reducing, except there's a slight increase from 3 to 4, and currently is about 1.4. Another interesting fact is that if assume if you assume that infection has spread all over the country, then there are about as of now for every detected case there are about sixty-seven undetected cases. Okay, now from real data and plots, uh, this is what we got out of this uh, supermodel. Uh, the blue curve here denotes the actual India data for the current active infection, and these are all detected infection. The yellow curve depends, uh, is not depends, it's, it's prediction from the model. It's uh, fairly, comes fairly close to the prediction, although it seems to be overestimating it. Uh, it's uh, the blue curve is dipping faster now. Uh, the cumulatively, if you look at so this plot, it goes up to February end next year. Uh, according to the yellow curve, the total, you know, according to our model, total detected infection by February end will be a little more than a crore. The pandemic has peaked as uh, per the blue curve on 17 September, uh, and uh, our model also predicts the same. But this is very importantly contingent on the protection measures. If you recall, uh, the one over beta is today 8.2. That's because the number of protection measures have been put in place. If we go back to 4.6, and I'll come back, come to that slide shortly to show you what will happen if you remove all of them. Uh, by using the value of epsilon, we can calculate uh, or estimate the number of asymptomatic cases or undetected cases, which will give us the total number of cases. And according to that calculation, already about 30% of population has been infected and have actually recovered also, so that they have antibodies in, uh, in them. Uh, we also uh, cross-checked the predictions from our model mm -hmm. with the ICMR survey that was done in August and which was a pan-India survey for uh, looking at uh, antibodies presence in the population. And by what ICMR survey showed was about 7% of population 
with antibodies. On the other hand, our model predicts about 14% population with antibodies in all of that. So there is a significant gap between what ICMR survey showed and what our model showed. So this raises some doubt about whether our model is getting it right or not. Although it, from this blue does appear as if it is estimating it reasonably well. So we did cross-check it further against another data where ICMR has conducted two surveys, which is uh, the city of Delhi. So this uh, yellow curve again is a prediction from the model and the blue curve is uh, what comes out, what is the reality. If you notice, first thing that the, the third, seemingly there is a third surge here from October 12th. This has not been predicted by the model. And that's a limitation of the model really. And this is a limitation of every mathematical model that they cannot predict the behavior of people. From October 12th, beta value has increased by about 24%. So the spread has become faster. And that's why there has been a, this uptick in the number of infections. But there is, it's really the beta value is, as I said, dependent on the protection measures, lockdown measures, etc. So how that changes is really dependent on all of us. Here is a more interesting observation. So ICMR did two surveys in Delhi. One was in June end and one was in August end. In June end, it found 23.4% population with antibodies. And in August end, it found about 33% population with antibodies. According to our model, in June end, there were about 26% population with antibodies. And in August end, about 33% population with antibodies. So this two data points match reasonably well to given sense that the model is able to capture the reality in, in a fairly accurate way. It won't be completely accurate. After all, it's a very simplified model of what is actually a very complex dynamical system, but it does a reasonably good job. Okay. So one of the mandates of the committee was to simulate what if scenarios, that what would have happened if there was no lockdown or if there was a delayed lockdown. So this is what uh, we did. And it was a, doing the simulation was fairly easy because if there was a no lockdown, for example, the beta value would have remained at 4.6. Uh, the spread of infection across the region would have been much faster than what we observed by looking at epsilon t values. So this red curve is the plot of active infections, active detected infections, I should say, if there was no lockdown. You see that it peaks at more than 140 lakhs and that too sometime in June. The green and the purple curves are once we're assuming, the green curve assume, is assuming that there was a lockdown in on May 1st. The purple one is assuming that there was a lockdown on April 1st. Both exhibit roughly this very similar behavior with slight changes. And this yellow is what the prediction is for the actual lockdown. That is, if you see, the peak here is much lower and also occurs much later. So this phenomenon has allowed our medical infrastructure to gear up to addressing the needs of this pandemic. And also, the since the peak has, is at much lower level, it has again allowed uh, uh, better control of this pandemic. One may wonder that what, why is April 1 lockdown peak coming like this? Because this was April 26, uh, sorry, March 26 lockdown. This is not even a week's gap between the two. Well, this lockdown uh, is assuming that before that, free tra full travel was permitted. And it was pre-announced that from April 1st, there will be lockdown. So a lot of people will, uh, from wherever, wherever they were, they will go back to their respective homes. And in that process, will carry infection across various parts of the country. And that is why 
uh, you see a very different nature of this curve from this one. Uh, this is projected mortality is again pretty high. I'll not spend too much time on it. Here is a very interesting curve or phenomenon that is important to highlight. Uh, if you see active infections in India in March, from 18th to 31st March, in two weeks' time, the cases increased about 10 times. From 1st April to 12th June, that 73 days, the cases increased 100 plus times. So from here to here. The yellow one is the, again, prediction from the model. It goes slightly below the actual one. And in this part, it actually matches the model. So this demonstrate this rapid increase initially demonstrates uh, demonstrate the exponential growth in infection that occurs in the beginning. Another very interesting thing, if there was no lockdown, you see this red curve uh, shooting up very rapidly. That's what would have happened. In 73 days, from April to 12th June, the cases increased 100, about 100 times. They would have increased more than 10,000 times if there was no lockdown. And that is why that you see that sharp peak to more than 140 lakhs infections. So this is a summary of uh, various lockdown scenarios. Uh, if there was no lockdown, then we would be in a very, would have been in a very uh, bad situation. If there was a lockdown, but delay it and the travel permitted before that, things would still not be very good compared to what it actually has happened. Now coming to the future trajectories. Uh, we did a uh, simulation from 1st October. So this blue curve is what is coming in the real curve up to 30th September. And then we simulated five scenarios. Uh, the red one corresponds to that there being no measures. All the measures taken off, everything goes back to what it was before March this year. Then the green one is slightly re reduced measures. Yellow is what the current measures are. Purple is slightly stronger measures and black is even stronger measures. As you can see, if they were, we go back to what, how life was earlier, they immediately, the number of infections will start rising and this uh, peaks actually at more than 25 lakhs by the end of October. So within a month, really. Uh, green one is also uh, rising, but not that sharply. And uh, purple and yellow, uh, black ones are slightly below, but not significantly changed from the blue, uh, yellow one. So what this tells us is that the stricter measures from now onwards are not going to help us much. If we can maintain the current set of measures and that trajectory, that's going to be fairly good. So there is no need for no strict lockdowns now. We can actually open up the economy fairly um, completely. And uh, But we also have to keep in mind that personal protection measures that are being followed currently are absolutely essential. If you don't follow them, then uh, there will be sharp rises. And this is what is happening in several European countries right now. Yeah, I seem to have again stuck this. Uh, also, we have to be mindful that uh, with the winter approaching, there is some evidence that virus is more active in cooler climates. And uh, there is also evidence that uh, large gatherings uh, can cause infection to spread rapidly. Uh, one example is the Kerala I, they celebrated Onam festival during August 10th. And from 7th, uh, 8th September, there was a sharp rise in the reported cases. And uh, we estimated the beta and gamma values for September. Beta increased by about 32% and gamma decreased by 22%. So it's like worse of the both worlds happened for Kerala in September. And that is why there has been a sharp peak in Kerala recently. So uh, to summarize uh, key conclusions for the past is that uh, the what the what if scenarios that we simulated tells us that uh, 
the way lockdown was done actually helped uh, the country to contain the effect of this pandemic to the extent possible. Uh, if there was no lockdown or delayed lockdown, things could have been worse. And for future, uh, there is a chance that this festival season and the winter season can increase the infection. So as a group, we have to be mindful and uh, follow proper safety protocols continuously. Uh, we cannot afford to relax there. And high level lockdowns, uh, district level or higher ones are not really needed now. Uh, lockdowns should happen only in like small community wise in case there is a rapid spread of infection in that community. And if we do manage, do follow all the personal protection protocols uh, in a fairly consistent way over the next few months, then our model predicts that uh, by February end next year, the number of infections will come down to a very manageable level. So that's all I have uh, in this presentation. I will now stop sharing. Uh, let me just take up the questions if there are any, and then we'll see. Now, there are, I see, a couple of questions. What is the prediction confidence limit as there is still no clarity on the life of RNA under different humidity and temperature? I believe everyone remains inside 21 days, not read the whole thing. Okay, I cannot read the whole question, but let me respond to the part that I, what is the prediction limit on the life? It's not clear. I mean, there is really no clarity about how uh, this virus reacts to various things. There are a lot of studies under right now going on, but uh, many things which have been predicted have turned out to be wrong. It was predicted, for example, that in extreme heat, it will not survive. It has actually survived and flourished. So a uh, lot of questions yet are yet to be answered. So it's better to be prudent and careful. What technology you are using, asking as computer science professional, rest of the questions I will ask by email. Well, I mean, I don't think I have used any technology except uh, to do some simple calculations or an estimation of parameters which are done through an Excel sheet. So that's the question so far. If there are any other questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Okay, so I think we can close this. Okay, thank you for everyone for joining in. I hope uh, I managed to communicate uh, the important features of this supermodel and its uh, predictions.